Let's break the political talk show mold. Anything worth doing is hard, and that includes being a good citizen. Our mission is to help you be that better citizen by letting you hear about stuff you might not know, which will make everyone think you're so smart, or by giving you a chance to listen to interviews and debates on a wide variety of subjects that might actually allow you to form new opinions in the privacy of your own mind. I'm Justin Oldham, and you are listening to the Politics and Patriotism Show here on the Stitcher Smart Radio Network. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to another historical edition of the Politics and Patriotism Show. Over the next 35 minutes, I'd like to bring you a conversation I had with author and noted naval historian David L. Sears. His book is entitled Pacific Air. It was published in 2012 by DeCapo Press, and it covers an interesting facet of the Pacific Air War that I think is relevant in today's world. It's interesting to me as a historian to consider the whole scope and scale of the Pacific theater, knowing full and well that here in the 21st century, we're now looking at the rise of China on the backdrop of a high-tech Japan. So with that in mind, it was very interesting to me to dig into the nuts and bolts of what Sears had to say about the Pacific Air War. And he's writing primarily from the American point of view, although he does have quite a bit of educational material in there for you that talks about the ordeals of the Japanese pilots. And in particular, you're going to hear some things in this conversation about a noted Japanese air ace called Saburo Sakai. So if you want to Google that name now, go ahead and do it because it'll make for some good reading. Now, while the geopolitics of the thing does fascinate me, I'm also interested in the way that the technology changed, the nature of what the aircraft carrier was compared to what it is today. I think it'll be worth your time to hear what the author has to say about all this. So without any further ado, let's hear from David L. Sears. This is him talking about his book, Pacific Air, which was published in 2012 by DeCapo Press. We are poor little who have lost our way. Ba, ba, ba. General quarters, general quarters, all hands, man, you battle stations. What do we need to know about David Sears? Well, I'm an author of uh, military history books. Uh, Pacific Air was my fourth book. Formerly, uh, early in my career, a Navy officer in the U.S. Navy with experience aboard a destroyer and as an advisor in, in Vietnam. And then uh, corporate experience and on the business side with uh, the New York Times Company and Dow Jones and Company. And uh, graduate of uh, Cornell University undergraduate and uh, a University of Pennsylvania graduate. Okay, now I ask this question to everybody, so please mm -hmm. just bear with me. What was it specifically about Pacific Air that made you want to write that book? Well, it seemed an opportunity to uh, cover the uh, the war in the Pacific from the standpoint, from actually from two standpoints. One from the, the carrier um, uh, pilots uh, who flew the combat missions in the Pacific War, and secondly, from the standpoint of the um, the young high tech engineers who uh, developed the technologies that uh, led to the planes that uh, defeated the Japanese uh, over the Pacific. So it was a way of uh, telling the same story from from two angles and uh, giving that perspective uh, on carrier a a aviation uh, during World War II. Now, I strongly suspect you got a soft spot in your heart for carriers because your book opens with a rather lengthy quote from Ernie Pyle in which he waxes eloquent about the nobility of the aircraft carrier. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm a, um, I'm, I'm a, as a story in my area, one area of, of real interest is uh, World War II, and so much is written about the, uh, the war in Europe. 
uh, lesser amounts are written about the war in the Pacific, and the real game changer as far as the Pacific War uh, were the carriers. The aircraft carrier's evolution, uh, most people don't realize this, actually goes all the way back to World War I, but the, uh, the leaps forward time and time again, which are made in the Pacific, in the, in the arena of carrier aviation, are, in my mind, breathtaking, simply because it seems like every six months somebody somewhere is pulling something new out of their back pocket, and while it's a given that war always sparks innovation, so much of that technology was incorporated into civilian aviation after the war that I don't think most people are aware of you know the, the debt that they owe those aircraft designers from that period. Well, absolutely not. I mean, I, you know, in cases of technology, at least, um, at least it used to be that war would advance uh, technology on a on a broad front, and certainly that was the case for um, for aviation uh, during World War II. And in that sense, it's like uh, you know the commitment to go to the moon that you have to develop the technology that that's going to uh, make that possible. And because the uh, war in the Pacific and the war in Europe were both um, both added elements of aviation that hadn't been there before, uh, so there was a real uh, race by both sides, by the, the Axis and by the the Allies, uh, to he- develop technologies that would control the skies. As I'm looking at my bookshelf here in my office, I can see that you you really are quite right. There is comparatively little written about the war in the Pacific. So let me ask you a hard question. Here we are in the 21st century, and let's put aside the fact for the moment that we're we're, we're we are World War II buffs here. Mm-hmm. What does somebody listening to this conversation need to know about the war in the Pacific from a 21st century perspective? From a 21st century perspective, I mean, I think one thing to know about the war, at least, to, is to understand its context. Uh, it was conducted in a, on a battlefield that was uh, largely ocean, and the distances involved between battles and the sites of battles uh, were immense. And in terms of naval battles, uh, it was the first time that uh, an enemy would fight uh, another enemy uh, without, uh, the sh- from a shipboard standpoint, without coming in sight of that enemy. It started with the, the Battle of the Coral Sea in, uh, in early 1942. That was a battle of uh, aircraft and, and carriers, but the ships involved never came within sight of each other. And that's been kind of the uh, the template for the evolution of uh, warfare, of strategic warfare ever since, you know, coming up to the 21st century. I guess another thing to know, another thing to realize is that with the developments uh, in North Korea and in China, uh, the Pacific Ocean, uh, which for the last you know, 70 or so years has basically been an American lake, um, uh, is going to be challenged again, uh, hopefully peacefully, but um, uh, a sea that the, the U.S. has controlled through its navy uh, is now being uh, contested by uh, the likes of China. Okay, now since you've brought that up, I do have a question from the mailbag here. What are the biggest contrasts from the World War II carrier to the modern day carrier? And it seems rather obvious, of course, that uh, at least for the United States, that the, the biggest contrast is the, the, the nuclear power thing. But in terms of sheer military capability, what are the biggest dichotomies between now and then? Well, I think, you know, because of of uh, jets and uh, the ability to strike it at long range, uh, the carrier has you know, truly become a, a mobile platform that can take uh, the battle to the enemy uh, anywhere in the world. I think one thing that's evolved for the, for the carrier is that more and more often uh, they become um, multi-purpose ships, um, in the recent wars in Iraq and, and uh, in Afghanistan, it's been less about jet fighters, for example, and more about uh, mobility for special operations. So it's more the use of helicopters and uh, less high-tech aircraft than the, than the uh, fighter jet. I want to take a quick commercial break here, and when we come back on the other side, I want you to tell us what you think about the way in which the Navy's role is changing. 
This program is brought to you by ShadowFusionBooks.com. Okay, thanks for the standby. So pick up where we left off. Talk to us now about the way in which the Navy's role is changing. In some ways, the war at sea is, in some regards, becoming a little bit more like the war of the of the 18th and 19th century. For example, where uh, the, new, the U.S. Navy has to deal with, uh, with pirates, and it has to deal with uh, close inshore type of uh, warfare, and that really is evolving both the uh, carriers and the other surface ships in the uh, in the U.S. Navy. I notice that just in terms of reading this book, that uh, most of the combat in the Pacific theater during World War II seems to have been deep water. How much of it was littoral? Well, obviously, when you're talking about invasions of uh, islands, you know, Iwo Jima and Okinawa and the Marshalls and the Gilberts and so so on, that's that's by nef- definition literal warfare. It's it's inshore. It involves amphibious ships. It involves uh, uh, mine sweepers and mine layers. Uh, so, uh, although the, you know, my wa- the the book I've written is primarily about uh, aviation, uh, the island war is a, another context for the Pacific War. And okay, now, since we're back to the aviators again. I lost track of the total number of people you've referenced in this book. It's got to be well north of a uh, hundred and fifty or so. But these yeah. were these these were men who, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, no, no. The, the, these the, the, these were men who hold a singularly unique place in history, simply because the invention of the airplane happened in their lifetime. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I, one thing uh, to note about uh, naval aviators, uh, carrier-based naval aviators, is that in, in wartime, in wartime for them, the the, the battle uh, begins from uh, taking off from a very short deck, tossing in the middle of an ocean. So they have to get off the uh, uh, the, the base before they can even go off to war. And even when they're com- complete with their their missions, they still have to land successfully on that same tight airstrip. So there's a very different dimension to the, the skills and qualities and, and um, uh, I guess, hero- heroism of, the, of the, the naval aviator flying from a, uh, an aircraft carrier. Very different from uh, fi- uh, flying and returning to a, a land base. Okay, so talk to me about the background of the men of the day, uh, you know, uh, Jimmy Thatch and Butch O'Hare, and and contrast that to the the pilots that we see today. Because when it comes to naval aviation, everybody still looks at it in terms of uh, uh, what they think they know about the movie Top Gun. Right. And you know, I, I just think there's so much more to be said there. So uh, please, uh, you know, t- tell us what really separates these eras. Well, I think you know, I think from a you know a personality standpoint and from uh, an approach to flying, I'm I'm not so sure that that Top Gun is that far off the mark. Obviously, these are uh, young men and now young men and women uh, who are have terrific skills and. Uh, a big sense of uh, invincibility and a willingness to to try anything and very sure of themselves. So I think that's a quality that's uh, kind of spanned the ages as far as uh, aviation or combat aviation is concerned. Um, a lot of the you know the approach that I took in the book in Pacific Air was from a from a fighter pilot standpoint was to look at different generations of pilots, the ones that were. Uh, coming of age uh, in the years between the wars, primarily in the 1930s, uh, the ones who fought in the earliest stages of the Pacific War, and then as it went along, handed off the uh, the baton to other flyers. Now, for example, uh, Jimmy Thatch uh, was really a mentor to uh, to Butch O'Hare, another famous uh, naval aviator, and Butch O'Hare uh, was a mentor to a guy named Alex Vrashu, who's uh, covered in the final uh, chapters of uh, Pacific Air. So it's that sense of, uh, of developing skills, uh, passing them on to the next quote-unquote generation, because we're talking about people who are maybe three, four, or five years younger than you, and then uh, going back uh, to the States or going on to, to higher rank and higher responsibility 
or to training. Uh, now, that was something that the, the Japanese during the Pacific War, uh, they basically had one generation of flyers, and they stayed in the battle and until and uh, until they were either wounded and put out of action or till they were killed, and that, that was a decisive factor during the Pacific War. Uh, now, speaking of Japanese flyers, you... Uh... Uh, you, you quote quite extensively from Saburo Sakai, and I'd like to know how typical was he for the, the pilots of his generation, because his is the only book I have in my library. I don't think I've ever seen another book by a Japanese aviator from that period. Well, there, um, yes, there, there are books out there. Uh, you know, he, he, he was uh, a, a case to use because uh, his uh, career kind of spanned uh, the rise and the fall of uh, Japanese aviation. He, he came of age uh, in the 30s, uh, as a flyer anyways, when the Japanese uh, were very active uh, from a fighting standpoint in the skies over China. And uh, Saburo was also present uh, during the earliest stages of the Pacific War, specifically the, the Battle for Guadalcanal. And uh, beyond that, he was, uh, and after the Battle of Guadalcanal, he was seriously injured uh, and struggled after that to get back into the fight. So he, he became kind of a symbol for the, the course of, of Japanese aviation, where at the beginning of the war, in terms of skills and experience, uh, the Japanese flyers were head and shoulders above the American, um, and also probably in terms of the aircraft they had access to. But as the war progressed, they got some of them got wounded, like Saburo, and uh, the aircraft that they were flying really didn't change that much, didn't evolve that much to uh, keep up with the course of the war. Now, you mentioned in the course of your book that a third of American aviators were killed by such a wide range of things that it almost seems like uh, combat losses were were incidental. How, how does that stack up to, well, uh, to Japanese I, losses? Uh, I think, you know, the, I think the figure I quoted was probably was those killed and, and those put out of action. And I, I, I'm not sure you can can be comparable with the Japanese, but, you know, the, the kind of the effects that we're talking about are obviously uh, there's, there are deaths in combat, but there are many deaths in uh, training. Uh, there are many deaths in uh, or plane losses and injuries in taking off from aircraft carriers and in landing on aircraft carriers. Um, for a number of months, Navy pilots were stationed on the likes of Guadalcanal, where they were subject to dysentery and, and malaria and all kinds of other disease. Just that, you know, aviation uh, by itself, combat aviation, is an inherently dangerous field, obviously, when there's combat going on, but just as often when uh, you're trying to get there or trying to get back. The Japanese losses are uh, were tremendous, and some of them are skewed by the what happened at the end of the war uh, when there were so many of the, the younger pilots and some older pilots as well that were either that either volunteered or were drafted into the uh, the ranks of the kamikazes. I was rather surprised to learn that Sakai did not get a pension after the war. And according to what I've read in your book, he seems to have been rather poorly treated by his own government. And uh, I'm just curious to know what you can tell me uh, uh, about his personal fortunes uh, after the fact. I mean, did did his book eventually make enough money for him to live on? Did he get another job? What happened to the man? Well, I, it seems to me that very late in life and before he died, he had some sort of uh, printing business um, within Japan. But at the, the close of World War II, you have to understand that uh, all of the Japanese military was... Uh, put out of business, and there were no uh, pensions, there were no uh, veterans' uh, benefits, because basically the Japanese military was uh, disallowed under the terms of the, the treaty and the, uh, under the terms of the armistice and the, uh, and the treaty. And I think that um, once those effects started to wear away, I think, I think he may have had an opportunity to go back uh, into some form of military aviation. But by that time, he was so upset and so down on, the, on the, even the prospect of uh, um, wartime aviation that he just uh, he walked away from it. And, you know, he struggled through life. Uh, he lost his, uh, lost his wife. Um, I think that was after the war. But had a very t hard time of it up until his death. Yeah, war is a war is a tough thing, and uh, as as we're looking at this book in the shadow of uh, Afghanistan and the recently completed Iraq, 
I'm drawn back to your chapters on uh, the Grumman Aircraft Corporation, and if ever there was an American success story, the plucky little company that could, these guys certainly did. And I'm, I, I'm not sure that a lot of people know about the humble origins of, of this company. And I think if they did, it, it, would, it would be a very uplifting story. I mean, there's, a, there's enough material right there, I'm sure, for a, a whole other book by itself. But what is the, the, the state of the civilian defense industry today uh, in regards to naval aviation? Are there any more plucky companies out there like that that are pushing the envelope? Uh, to tell you the truth, I really don't know. I know that you know the Grumman, which was kind of a, you know, a, a, a garage startup uh, before the war, evolved to become a, a huge uh, aviation uh, concern at the end of the war. And in the past few years, has been uh, recently uh, absorbed by by Boeing. And uh, to understand the the, the template for uh, Grumman, I think one of the things that made them successful is that its founder, or one of its founder founders, was Roy Grumman, who had been trained as a naval aviator and uh, understood the, the challenges and difficulties that naval aviators faced. The fact that they were going to be flying over broad stretches of ocean, the fact that they'd be landing and taking off from an aircraft carrier, and that their planes had to be resilient enough and uh, tough enough to uh, withstand that punishment. You know, early uh, before the war, Grumman was basically in competition with uh, Boeing uh, for the various uh, models of uh, fighter aircraft that were being, mainly biplanes that were being tried out on carriers. And in effect, uh, Boeing lost out to Grumman when it's one of its latest planes, uh, a biplane, uh, was put through a test of landing within the space it would take to land on an aircraft carrier. It succeeded, but each time uh, its wings would bounce, and they would bounce and hit the deck. And uh, just looking at that, comparing that with what the Grumman plane did, uh, Grumman became the de facto provider of, um, of fighter aircraft to the U.S. Navy. But, you know, in terms of, of, of current technology, uh, you know, I don't really feel qualified to, to talk that m- much about that because I, d- I really don't have a sense of that. You know, the one thing I have been following and looking at with interest is the literal, literal um, surface craft that the, the Navy is developing and how that will evolve for uh, surface warfare. Not so up on... Uh, the latest developments in aviation technology. Okay, so with Grumman's uh, very unique, almost magical situation to uh, to help equip the United States Navy, I'm still left with a question that I've had ever since I was a kid, really, because I've been reading about World War II ever since I was eight years old. It, it, it seems almost implausible that the the Japanese with their limited industrial base could could ever hope to to win that conflict and yet as you talked about earlier they they came up with some very innovative designs in their day now I need to take one more quick commercial break here and when we come back on the other side I'd like you to spend a little bit of time perhaps the last few minutes of the show and tell us about the evolution of Japanese naval air power. You are listening to another Politics and Patriotism podcast. Find us online through iTunes. Just in the uh, in the interest of fairness, would you please talk to us for a few minutes about the uh, the, the evolution of the, the Japanese naval air aviation capability during that war? Well, uh, you know, it was a, a difference in uh, approach. I mean, you can use the, the Japanese zero as kind of the, the prototype or the, the symbol for the, the strengths and weaknesses of Japanese a- aviation. Uh, you know, they developed their, their designs and their capabilities um, during the time of the war with China, which was, um, you know, the mid-1930s, and they came up with aircraft that were uh, both aircraft and pilots that were perfectly suited uh, to that uh, type of environment. Their pilots were immensely skilled, um, and they focused on developing the aircraft that were uh, very fast, 
um, very uh, maneuverable, uh, very light, uh, both light on weight and light on technology. Um, I mean, for example, um, uh, the Japanese pilots, uh, most of them didn't want to have radios in their aircraft because it was ex much extra weight at that standpoint, and they felt that they didn't need it. They could do fine with uh, hand signals uh, when flying in combat. Um, they were not particularly eager to have uh, self-sealing fuel tanks. And, in fact, most Japanese uh, aircraft were kind of flying torches. If, you know, they were great and maneuverable and fast and very effective, but when they were hit, uh, they had a tendency to you know, go up like torches. Um, from the American standpoint, and, you know, the American pilots, in one sense, were like Japanese pilots. They wanted light uh, aircraft that were light and, and maneuverable, uh, and at first they didn't like the aircraft, the heavier aircraft, with uh, self-sealing tanks. Um, they were concerned about uh, not carrying as much ammunition as they, they could, and they, many of them were not too happy with the uh, folding wings uh, that were developed by Grumman to increase the storage capacity for aircraft on aircraft carriers. But over the course of the war, the things like having good radio communications, um, uh, having self-sealing tanks, and having uh, aircraft that were, were well armored to protect the pilot, uh, initially it made up for the differences in skills between the Japanese and the American pilots. It made it kind of an even playing field. But as the war evolved, uh, those um, those technology differences really doomed uh, the Japanese Japanese aviators in their planes. Mm, that, that, that's a perfectly good point. Now, I want to make sure I understand something correctly here. Uh, are you saying that the Japanese pilots did not want self-sealing fuel tanks? Well, not so much didn't want self-sealing fuel tanks, but were concerned that things like that could add to the weight and uh, slow down the planes that they were flying. Um, some of it was a case of uh, the technology not getting to them as soon as it did to the Americans. Um, that may have been the case with self-sealing tanks. Um, but certainly in terms of uh, radios, uh, they a lot of them, and I think Saburo Sakai was one of them, who didn't see the need for uh, didn't see the need for radios. I'm aware that they didn't particularly care for armor for for reasons of both weight and mm -hmm. uh, and, and warriors' honor, but uh, that's a new, the self sealing fuel tank thing is is new for me. So, well, I think and again I, that may be the case of the technology arriving for the Japanese later than uh, for the Americans. But I know that self sealing tanks were being um, experimented with uh, by the Germans and the British uh, during the Battle of Britain. Okay. Now, as we come into the final minutes of this thing here, I've got, there, there's there's one question that now, I, I understand. I think I understand, but I'm curious to know from your own perspective, because I know people are are, are going to ask me about this. Why did you end the book as you did? I mean, as, as I kept reading, I kept imagining this thing on on the silver screen. So I, I, I strongly suspect you're a frustrated screenwriter in disguise. But uh, I'm I just want to know from you in your own words, why did you end the 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 book with the Marianas turkey shoot? Well, there were you know, uh, there were basically four uh, major carrier to carrier battles in the Pacific War during World War II. The first was uh, the Battle of uh, Coral Sea. The second was the um, Battle of Midway. Uh, the Marianas Turkey Shoot was the last of the four major carrier-to-carrier uh, -carrier battles uh, in the Pacific War. That's June of 1944. Am I correct there? Yes. And... Um, Although there was much more of the war to go, there were the kamikazes, for example, there was the Battle of uh, Leyte Gulf, there were the, um, um, the, the exploits of the 3rd and 5th Fleet in striking the Japanese home islands. My point was that for all intents and purposes, uh, the Japanese aviation, Japanese aviators and their planes as a threat to the Americans was basically ended there. So well was, said. That was the, the context. You know, you're looking at the, the major carrier-to-carrier -carrier battles. Now, obviously, the Battle of the Philippine Sea was a major naval battle, but it was a not, not 
a major carrier-to-carrier naval battle. And at that point in the war, in October of 1944, basically the Japanese were no longer capable of standing toe-to-toe, carrier-to-carrier with the U.S. Navy. Okay, and I'd like to wrap up by asking you what's next on your project list, because uh, with four books behind you, I somehow suspect that there's a fifth in your future. Yeah, you know, I'm working on a fifth, and uh, and I I, I kind of like to hold that close to the vest until uh, we have a book deal and we go forward. Enough so. said. It's it's <laughs> it's satisfying to me as an author myself to know that you're you're working on something else. That's uh, that's very good to know. Now, uh, for our listening audience, if they'd like to find you on the internet, what's the best place to look? Well, they we can look at uh, D. L. Sears Books. D.L. Sears Books is one word, D.L. Sears Books dot com. And uh, when when this next book is in the pipeline, uh, they'll learn about it there. Um, they'll learn about the, the current books that I have. And uh, we also produce or self-publish uh, some uh, calendars that commemorate the services of uh, destroyer sailors. It's called tin can calendar and we do one for carrier aviation as well it's called carrier air calendar and these are annual uh, historical calendars um, with roll calls of, of navy veterans that they might be interested in taking a look at And there you have it. That was David Sears telling us about the American and Japanese air war in the Pacific during World War II. I can't help but think that there are certain historical parallels between that and what we may face with the rising China. Now, superpower politics aside, that does bring us to the end of the program. So if you like what you heard here today, you can find us online at politicsandpatriotism.com, where we've got all kinds of free stuff for you. You can click on the RSS feed at the top of our page to download any of our past episodes for free, or you can use the Stitcher player that's right there on the main page so that you don't have to do anything more than just sit there and click and listen, or you can go to the iTunes store to download any of our past episodes for free. Or if you go to Stitcher.com, thanks to the very nice people at the Stitcher Smart Radio Network who distribute this program for us, you can download any of their free apps that will allow you to listen to our program on your smartphone or on your Android device or on your tablet, wherever you might be, on dry land or out at sea. So on behalf of everyone here at the show, thank you for your time and have a good day.